So the next presentation is on high tunnel organic fruit production in Michigan. It's presented uh, with by Greg Lang and his cooperator, Jim Cohn. Greg is professor of tree fruit physiology at Michigan State University. He also previously served on faculty out here at Washington State and also at LSU. He released and uh, co-released five new sweet cherry varieties and was the co-discoverer gene for sweet cherry powdery mildew resistance. He has authored more than 100 uh, research article and industry articles on cherry production, physiology, rootstocks, and varieties. Is, has compiled and edited more than four books on cherry and plant sciences. Greg speaks and consults on cherry production quite often. His collaborator, Jim Cohn, is proprietor of Almar Orchards in Michigan State, diversified certified organic fruit farm of more than five, 400 acres, 150 of which are planted in apples. Their farm includes a farm market, agritourism opportunities, production of JK Scrumpy Cider sold in most states and exported to Europe. It is a fermented beverage and a farrow to finish pig operation. Jim transitioned into certified organic production in the mid 1990s. His participates in on-farm research has been a key portion of what they do at Almar Farms for a number of years, including receiving numerous farm, farmer grants, collaborations with Michigan State University, as well as Jim's service as the director of North Central SARE program, a member of the Michigan Apple Research Committee, and on the OMRI board. So, Greg and Jim. We're a very young project when it comes to OREIs. We've looked at uh, one that started back in uh, almost 10 years ago or more, one that started in the middle of last decade, and this one really is only in the second year. So we don't have a whole lot of results, but we have a lot of big ideas, and that's what we're going to share with you today. I wanted to point out that uh, while Jim and I are presenting this work, as with the other OREIs, it's a very large group that is involved. You see our, our OREI award here is not only to myself, but John Birnbaum, who's an organic a vegetable specialist at our uh, department, Dan Brainerd, a cover crop specialist, uh, David Connor, who was at our department, he's now at Vermont, I believe, in economics, Matt Grishop, Ecosystem Services, Eric Hansen, Small Fruits, Rufus Isaacs, uh, entomology, and uh, anatomic children pathology. I'm going to give you some of the background that led us to this project. In fact, um, I should also mention our funding here through the Cirrus Organic Grant. Well, let's get this, my big fat fingers on this. Cirrus Organic Grant and the International Fruit Tree Association have been key funders of this work as well. Mm. My time is up. So um, I'll give you some background on how we got into an OREI project because as I was telling Kurt yesterday, the, I'm a virgin as it comes to, uh, when it comes to coming to this conference. I have only moved into organic recently, the same with my colleague Eric Hansen. Uh, we were working in high tunnel work for the last eight years and as we got into seeing all of the benefits of growing tree fruits in the Midwest under high tunnels, we began to realize there are some tools here that are going to provide much greater potential for organic fruit production uh, in our very challenging environment. Some of the challenges that we see for sweet cherries are climatic management of our rain. Of course, if you're familiar with cherries, you know that they will crack in the rain during the last four to five weeks of ripening. So you can have a beautiful crop out there. You can have it all the way up within two or three days of harvest and possibly have a rain that will destroy the crop and have it crack. So the number one reason to put a tunnel over a cherry orchard is to protect it from rain when you have a rainy environment such as ours. But we started to look at other advantages uh, or economic benefits that the tunnels would give us, such as some protections from spring frost. We began to see that they eliminated certain diseases, they eliminated certain insects. Of course, they increased other diseases and other insects when you dry that climate out and make it a lot more like the West here. Weeds, nutrients, and irrigation are managed very differently as you get into tunnels. And uh, looking at the target market economics for our growers, we're talking about putting a thirty dollars to $35,000 structure over an orchard. So automatically, we can't compete with production coming from the West. So we have to have our growers identify specific niche markets where they're going to get the kind of return that's going to help pay for their uh, ex uh, increased production costs. You know, just showing rain crack cherries for those of you who have never seen them. And we have shown 
I mean, we're giving a, a very small snapshot of the work that we've learned and how we're translating that into organic production. I have a poster, my, uh, one of my graduate students or co-graduate students, Ben Gluck, has a poster on the raspberry work. Mine is on the cherry work. Jim is going to talk about the apple work in this project. But we've even shown that you can crack cherries under tunnels. So management of the irrigation, where we're cracking the cherries through not the rain on the fruit, but through the irrigation uh, is also critical. Some of the challenges for raspberries in the Midwest. Harsh winters injure the floricanes of less hardy varieties. The short growing season limits the primocane fruiting harvest season. And so if we can extend that growing season, we can extend the harvest and in fact extend yields dramatically. Rain and high humidity promote fungal diseases and weeds just as they do in sweet cherries. So those are the key factors that we've been looking at. As I said, we started back in 2005 at two different research farms, our swim wreck or our Southwest research farm down in Benton Harbor, two hours away from main campus. This is that uh, uh, set up there. We put in an orchard in 2005. Um, we built the tunnel over it. We found that if you, unlike the folks that, that sell these multi-bay tunnels, the Haygrove company uh, and others, they say, well, you don't have to put your tunnel up until you're ready to protect your crop from rain. But we found certainly if you plant your crop under the tunnel, you reach fruiting much more quickly, 30% more growth per year in the tunnel than out. So we uh, strongly recommend planting in the tunnel. We're harvesting then on precocious rootstocks in the third year. We've done a lot of work with all sorts of different factors over these eight years, including, sorry again, uh, reflective ground mulches. And what you may not be able to see here is weed barrier fabric. We've got eight years of experience with weed barrier fabric. And I think we can probably go another eight years. I see absolutely no degradation of that fabric in there. So you talk about the huge expense of that sort of organic control for, for weeds. Um, it's a huge expense at the outset, but amortized over 15 years of an orchard, uh, it's going to pan out very nicely. With that, we've had very good weed control. We've started to think about ideas, and this is what we're integrating into the holistic organic project, how that weed barrier fabric also creates a barrier for insects, for fruit flies, for spotted wing drosophila, for plum curculio, that the pupa drop out of the fruit if they infest it, they overwinter in the ground. Well, we've got a barrier there for some of those insects. So can that be utilized in other ways besides being a barrier for weeds? Can it be a barrier for spores? We talked earlier today about uh, spores on leaves and apple scab. Well, we've got brown rot spores from mummies in stone fruits. And so how can we possibly integrate some kind of barrier issues uh, that, that extend into our disease uh, strategies. Now what we have found in the studies is that our organic matter decreases under a weed barrier fabric. You're not putting anything new into the soil. So with our new research in the OREI project, we're asking questions about can we cover the soil with the weed barrier fabric only at a certain period of time and then roll that back, put in a cover crop to increase the, uh, the organic matter in the soil, then roll the cover back out during the period of year where we're trying to limit weed control manage our water relations in the tree, et cetera. So those are some of the factors that we're asking in the OREI project. We also had a, a second set of tunnels put at our Clarksville station, which is about 45 minutes away. And at the, that station, it was all cherries. At this station, we had cherries, berries, vegetables, and cut flowers. Eric Hansen and I are the folks focusing here on the um, fruit. So some of the advantages that we found over these eight years, reduced risk of rain-induced fruit cracking, of course, excellent fruit quality, beautiful large fruit. Out here, they talk about fruit uh, in terms of row size. Well, in terms of scientific terms, uh, a 25 millimeter fruit is one inch. What we'd like to see is a 29 or 30 millimeter fruit. And if you're growing larger than that, you can really name your price for the premium of that fruit. We were, we've been able to grow 33, 34, 35, six, 35 and 36 millimeter fruit in the high tunnels. Better leaf health, better storage carbohydrates, and that translates to better winter survival because these high tunnels that we use are three season tunnels. We cover them at bloom, we take the plastic off at the end of the summer, the trees go through a normal wintering period, but they go through it with better storage reserves and they 
suffer less winter damage and less spring frost damage from our experiences over these eight years. More efficient water use, less wind and uh, evapotranspiration, and that translates to some of our better fruit quality, less wind bruising of delicate cherries like the yellow Rainier cherries. Reduced Japanese beetle damage. Japanese beetles don't seem to like to fly into tunnels. They, uh, we don't know exactly how they navigate. We know that honeybees get disoriented in tunnels because they navigate with polarized light and the plastic interrupts that. So maybe what works against us for honeybees and we use bumblebees works for us with Japanese beetles. Keeping the water off the trees has eliminated cherry leaf spot. It's reduced our bacterial canker, but not eliminated it. Uh, significant reduction or elimination of pesticides, and that's what's really pushed us towards organic. And we can manipulate bloom and early ripening. We can bring our cherries onto the market when California berries are on the uh, cherries are on the market and be out of the, the, the market about the time Washington State's coming in. Conventional bramble production in tunnels, some of the things we've learned with the, with the raspberries. The yields are much, much higher. Marketing uh, season can be extended both earlier and later. The quality is higher. The fruit is 20 to 30% larger in the tunnel. There's much less rot, uh, much longer shelf life. Very little in the way of leaf and cane diseases. Powdery mildew may be the, the one uh, disease that tends to increase in the tunnel. Same with cherries. Less Japanese beetle and leaf hoppers, but more spider mites. More spider mites with cherries as well. Less hardy varieties may be able to be grown in tunnels, but probably better in four season tunnels. And there's been work done at Cornell and Kansas and some other places with four season tunnels looking at brambles. But the work that we've all done has focused on these three season multi-bay tunnels. So this is the OREI project, just to show you how it's put together. We've got a fruit production team led by Eric Hansen and myself, soil management uh, team led by John Birnbaum and Dan Brainerd, um, organic soil expert and covering crop expert, the fruit protection team, Matt Grishop, Rufus Isaacs, Annemiek Schilder, production economics with David Connor and Vicki Maroney in extension, and then, uh, I can hardly even read that, uh, the outreach group, John Birnbaum, Vicki Maroney, and Adam Montry, who runs our overall high tunnel um, projects and websites for uh, outreach. Our stakeholders and advisory panel are my friend Jim Cohn here, Cheryl and Alan Kobernick uh, from North Star Organics in um, Cherries, Jerry McTotter from the MSU Student Organic Farm, Brad Morgan from Morgan Composting in our state, and Mary and Chris, uh, and I can't even say their last name there, from Kismet Fruit Farm, they're our uh, raspberry stakeholders. And this is one of the real challenges for us for an OREI project. When you're looking at how to grow organic fruit where it's not typically grown before, it's hard to find stakeholders because there are none. So that was one of our big challenges. These are the nine tunnels that we've now erected. So this is our third site. To do true organic, we had to put it on campus because it was close enough that the entomologists and the pathologists would then come and interact with us on a daily basis instead of having to drive 45 minutes to two hours away. So you can see we have a host of different experiments in here, OREI experiments, cirrus trust experiments, mixed fruit culture, pardon me, mixed fruit culture, nutrient management, weed and pest management, um, <clears throat> compost, organic fertilizers, and training systems. Uh, the CIRRUS uh, objectives overall, and ORI, OREI objectives, determine critical soil fertility, orchard floor, and planting system practices and management strategies such that we optimize our organic high tunnel production of raspberries and sweet cherries. Determine key insect and disease management components and practices to optimize that production. And identify and compare the cost. So you can see a, a trend here. That these are the same basic objectives that we saw in the strawberry OREI project and the apple project. How do we do it from a horticultural point of view? How do we manage the pest issues? And then what's the economics of that work out to be? And then overlaid on that, well, I guess on the next slide, we'll talk about Jim's work and I'll turn it over to Jim just to uh, give you a little bit of background on the anticipated pests and diseases that we've either seen or we expect to see. Spider mites, one of our biggest issues, both uh, fruit crops, aphids, yes. 
Japanese beetle, yes, but we only see the Japanese beetle issues right on the peripheries. The beetles don't come into the interior of the tunnels. Spotted wing Drosophila, for sure, in raspberry. We just haven't had any fruit in there yet, so I'm sure we're going to see spotted wing Drosophilas in, the, in our cherries. Cherry fruit fly, plum curculio, leaf hoppers, sawflies, botrytis, and anthracnose. We eliminate those issues in raspberries with the tunnel. Powdery mildew increases in both. Bacterial canker, we see it, but it's decreased. Brown rot, we see it, and we need to control it. We don't uh, have good controls for that yet. And leaf spot, we eliminate leaf spot, both in raspberry and cherry with a high tunnel. The fun stuff for me horticulturally is we're looking at these high efficiency sweet cherry training systems in the tunnel, comparing all three of these, a sort of uh, traditional spindle system, super spindle system from Stefano Musaki's uh, work in Bologna, Italy, and the UFO system from Matt Whiting's work out here at Washington State University. The reason we're really looking at that is we're trying to maximize uh, the efficiency of um, of uh, that very expensive tunnel space. A narrow canopy improves our light penetration under a tunnel, gives us better fruit quality, and improves our spray coverage, and gives us the ability to look at some unique ways to apply our foliar sprays for pest control and for um, uh, nutrient uh, applications. So here I'm going to turn it over to Jim to show you the focus of the apple work is to look at apple nursery trees sorry again, grown in the tunnel and grown outside the tunnel. Clearly much larger trees. So we're asking questions about the fungal dominated versus bacterial dominated compost as a propagation media, the spacing for propagation, the depth of the soil in propagation. How can we use that tunnel space to create a nursery tree equal to that created out here in the West? So I chose this title investigating rather than research because what we're putting together is a bunch of practices. We're truly not researching five minutes. I was supposed to have 10. You should have given him five before this. Okay. So let me back up here. So anyhow, um, I've been growing apples for 35 years in the, in the commercial nurseries all these years kept telling me that, they need to leave, that I need to leave the practical, professional growing of propagated apple trees to them, that growers can't do that. So I wanted to disprove that through the years. So our farm is now becoming a third generation. I have three children involved in it, and it's pretty typical of, of what's going on in Michigan except that um, we're relatively large in an organic scale compared to most. But we do a diversified operation with uh, farm marketing and, and um, so on and so forth. We also produce a lot of cider. Um, that produces about a million pounds of uh, dispensed apple pulp a year that we feed to the pigs as their main food source. And then we recycle the nutrients from that. So where, what I wanted to look at is, does it really make sense for organic apple growers to produce their own apple trees in Michigan? We were told that we do not have enough heat units to drive a tree in Michigan, and they need to be produced either on the very east coast or out in the west coast out here. So we wanted to look at that. Like a teeter-totter, and different weights on it, you need to make a decision which way is this going to go. The reason I got thinking about this is because three different times I bought commercial nursery trees and introduced bad diseases onto my farm, difficult to control. One of them was a fire blight resistant, streptomycin resistant fire blight as an example. So if we can isolate that, we're going to mitigate some uh, risk with uh, infecting with new disease. We uh, organic growers have a tough time getting the right variety on the right rootstock uh, because the large commercial nurseries want to produce galas, Fujis, Braeburns. We're growing apples for niche varieties, uh, niche varieties uh, for a niche market. 
uh, things, a lot of them are her heritage varieties or disease resistant varieties. The nurseries don't want to propagate a lot of those. So I have to put an order in for, let's say, 4,000 trees two years ahead of time. They're only going to propagate 4,000 trees. When I get my trees, there's only 3,000 of them because they culled some of them. They probably sold some to somebody else. So it creates a problem because I didn't get the trees I ordered, right? Okay. And on our farm and most uh, eastern growers, they already have most of the equipment necessary to, to uh, get in the nursery business and grow our own trees. So it's kind of like a no-brainer. Uh, most of us have high tunnels or boxes, which I'll explain uh, a little later how we do. Available farm labor it so happens in the nursery, on-farm nursery business that a lot of labor coincides with lull times on our farm that we are looking for work for our people. So it's a nice fit there. Plant health, compromised immunity system in commercial trees. I know I'm, that it's kind of like some of you that drank too much beer last night or had too much candy. It kind of messes your system up. And, and, and the nitrogen and the hormones that they feed these trees, when I get them, it takes me two, three years to regulate that back out again. So to avoid that, I think if we could grow organic trees, uh, on our farm, uh, we're going to eliminate a lot of immunity problems or compromised immunity problems. But the most important thing here is the availability for fall planting. When we buy a tree to put in two minutes, double that. When, when, we, buy, when we buy a tree from a commercial uh, um, nursery, um, we put that in in the spring. Ideally, you want to put a, a, a tree in in the fall because you're going to get root growth after that tree goes to sleep in October. You're still going to get root growth in November, December, and again in, in uh, March and April. So there's less transplant shock. That tree is ready to go in the springtime in producing a stronger, healthier tree. Also, um, synchronized bloom. When I buy a tree from a commercial nursery, it's, it's dormant and it blooms two or three weeks after my rest of my trees on the farm bloom, and that's prime fire blight uh, season at that point in time. So by putting the tree in in the fall, you're going to have blooms going to be in sync with everything else. And also in the fall, we have more time to plant the tree and get the trellis system and everything in place. So from what we've learned so far, several of these, we've already figured out high tunnel versus outside growth. Greg's already said that we, we double the size of our tree already by doing that. Needed nitrogen rates. We were told for years you got to feed that tree a lot of nitrogen. I gave it so much in some block so much nitrogen that I thought I was going to kill the tree. No effect on growth. Life of the compost. Jury's out on that yet because um, uh, it, uh, we're in our third year now, and I can't see any difference between putting the tree in that compost the first year second year or third year. Hopefully it'll be four, five, six years we can grow that tree in the same compost. Grafting techniques for bench grafting, uh, which is done in, in March, and then we put the trees out in May. Um, let me see you put your sign down. Very good. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're convinced that the whip and tongue is much better than the chip. Uh, again, fall, more, fall planting. Last year was the worst case scenario, probably zero. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Um, and um, what happened there was, worst case scenario, the, the, we didn't have any hard frost, so the trees didn't go into dormancy. Um, when we put them in the ground, uh, uh, we had a lot of rain, but um, we had uh, uh, no snow cover much in the winter and a lot of up, high ups and downs in temperature. It should have killed a lot of trees out, none. So I, I'm convinced we can do fall planting here in Michigan. Um, disease and, inst and pest control, no problems. We're growing right in the middle of our organic orchards, and, and our predators are pretty well taken care of. Uh, any problems, we might have to pick June bugs off or something like, or ladybugs off, or uh, uh, Japanese beetle off by hand, but that's about it. Now we're, we're starting to figure out, we're, we're digging our own trees out of our own orchard in the fall, and then grafting those in the springtime, and it seems like they're doing as, as good or better than the commercial uh, ones that we buy. And then lastly, uh, it's going to take a while to figure it out exactly what the 
what the uh, cost is. But um, I'm convinced that in the long run, we can produce a, strong, a better, stronger organic tree than the conventional people can do because in, in one season, we put, we put a whip together and put that out in the tree in the orchard. And the second year, we're all already growing uh, feathers on that. And a commercial nursery's taking them two years. They're putting that on their farm. But then there's transplant shock for those guys. We don't have that. And then we're playing around with, with doing the biaxial because I think even though there's more training time involved in that in the beginning, in the life of the orchard, we're going to get better production. Uh, just fly pictures. And, and one of them, this is whip and tongue uh, bent that we just put in. You can see it's got two buds on it. Uh, this, we'll plant these in the greenhouse. Uh, 20 by 100 greenhouse, you can easily get 1,000 trees in it. These were just planted out last of April. Uh, we're also putting them in one-way bins, about a foot of compost in there. This is kind of neat. You can get about 100 trees in there. You can move them around if you need to and, and put a plastic over them and simulate what's happening in a high tunnel. Uh, this is a high tunnel right after we put the plastic off. We only keep plastic over the high tunnel for about six weeks. We're just giving them a, a jump start, and then we pull it back off right now. Uh, this is the uh, latter half of June, good growth on them. Oh, and you can see we've got netting around here to keep the, the deer out and uh, rabbits. Uh, this is just before they're going into uh, 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 sleep in the fall. And you all know what this is. This is the middle of winter after we planted them and, and put our trellising system up. You can see that the, uh, there's still a little bit of leaves left on the tree. They didn't quite go dormant when we put them in the ground. Didn't hurt them any. And of course, every farmer's got a dog, wants to get in the movies. So that's my, my friend there. So uh, in summary, I think that uh, organic production makes sense or organic nursery uh, propagation makes sense. Uh, on a farm and that uh, we're going to figure out a few things yet the jury's still out but overall I think it makes sense for most organic growers in the eastern side of the United States to consider growing their own trees.